Good morning. How's everybody as we are winding down the summer? It's great to see all of you. Our little ones dismissed for uh, Children's Church. Our last two Sundays in Mark's Gospel, we have studied two of Jesus' most important teachings. First, on hell, and then last week on marriage and divorce and remarriage. We saw last week how when Jesus discussed the issue of marriage, he put women on an equal footing with men. This was revolutionary for its time, way before the modern uh, feminist movement. Today we're going to learn about another of Jesus' very radical teachings uh, where he tells us the worth of children, not just to us, but the worth of children to God. So this is such an important paragraph, I'm going to devote the entire message today just to that particular subject from God's Word. So would you join me in prayer as we pray? Father, thank you for Lafayette Bible Chapel, and I pray that uh, you would continue to guide us, guide our leaders. Lord, as we look to you uh, for the ministry first, for you working in people's lives through the Word, through classes, through each other, but Lord, also we uh, look to you to provide the place where you would want us to meet. And Lord, if that is here, We're trusting you to work that out. If it is not, Lord, we're praying and trusting you uh, to provide all that we need, the location, the funds, and everything. And Lord, you're such a great God that you can do everything, and so we're calling out to you in dependence and faith. Lord, I'd also like to pray this morning uh, for those who have been ill, uh, those who've had injuries, uh, those who've had surgeries, that you will help them to continue to recover. Lord, bring healing to their bodies and to their uh, minds and souls. Uh, Give them relief from pain where that is needed. And Lord, I would in particular pray for this lady who was involved in this accident very close here, that you would give great mercy to the doctors in the emergency room right now in helping her. I pray, thank you for the folks who were able to um, stop and help her, even some of our own. And so I pray, Lord, that you would work in that situation to... uh, Uh, heal this woman and also uh, draw her to yourself. Father, would also uh, want to pray for those who are uh, grieving from the loss of loved ones, uh, from friends. And Lord, we know that you are the God of all comfort and that you comfort us in all of our affliction so that we can comfort others who are suffering in any affliction. So Lord, we commit this message to you. Help us today to see children like you do. Help us to grow in our commitment to win and disciple children. And especially, Lord, help us to involve children in ministry at a very early age together with us. And we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning by just beginning to read our passage, the paragraph in its entirety, um, beginning in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Some people were bringing little children to Jesus so he might touch them, but his disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, that is to his disciples, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you, whoever does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. After taking the children in his arms, Jesus laid his hands on them and blessed them. One of the most uh, popular paragraphs in God's Word, and so I want us to look at it for the next few minutes. In verse 13, the people bringing the children to Jesus, of course, were, I think, mainly their parents, perhaps some siblings. The Greek tells us that these little children ranged in age from infants up to elementary age that we would say today. Children who couldn't run up to Jesus had to be carried to him. (coughs) Touch was one of Jesus' signature ministry styles when he healed people. He often touched them. Healthcare professionals tell us the therapeutic value of human touch. 
Mother Teresa, you remember, was famous for touching both lepers and AIDS patients in different countries. And most of you know that I'm a touchy-feely kind of guy, that I like to shake hands, I like to hug people, I like to pat them on the back, I like to pet cats and dogs, and so, you know, count me in for that sort of ministry too. In verse 16, the words taking them in his arms could also be translated that Jesus hugged the children. It could be both. But Jesus' disciples were as clueless as they ever were, and they shooed these children and their parents away like we would shoo chickens. The Greek word rebuked in verse 13 is the same strong word that we encountered earlier in Mark's gospel when Jesus rebuked demons. So if you can imagine the same force that Jesus rebuked demons, his disciples are rebuking these parents, bringing their little kids just for Jesus to touch them. Uh, You can just hear the angry disciples' deep, ugly voices. Get away from the master. Don't bother him. Then it was Jesus' turn to get angry. The very strong Greek word that is used of Jesus here, indignant, really doesn't cut it. Uh, He was extremely angry. It's used of him nowhere else in the Gospels. Not against the Pharisees, not against his enemies, but against his disciples. He was furious. You don't have to, you don't want to make Jesus angry. But as always, Jesus used this as a teachable moment. So let's learn, along with Jesus' other disciples, what he had to teach. Verse 14, Jesus says positively, we are to let little children come to him, and negatively, don't stop them. So how can we let little children come to Jesus? Well, we have Sunday school, we have children's church, we have opportunities to learn the Bible. And so through all of those, there's no doubt that Jesus does want children to come to him. But is that all there is to it? I'd like to give you a homework assignment over lunch today. With your family, with your friends, whoever you have lunch with, or if you eat by yourself, think about how we can welcome children and not push them away? What are some ways that we can welcome kids? What are some ways that we can accidentally or otherwise push them away? And then I would like to suggest that your family pick one of those ways that that we can either welcome or not push them away and put it into practice. Is there a child in your extended family, a neighbor kid, that you could put your arm around, that you could be a big brother or sister to, of spiritual mom or dad, and perhaps bring them here to church. It takes some work. It takes calls or texts. It takes planning. It takes getting there earlier to get here on time. But I would like to just encourage you to let's don't just study what Jesus said to his disciples. Let's do what he said. Very simple. We could just go home right here. Why does Jesus want children to come to him? Because God's kingdom now and forever belongs to children and to anyone who is like a child. But Jesus goes much further than just that. He says, I assure you, that's his famous phrase, amen, I tell you. Whoever doesn't welcome or receive God's kingdom like a child will never enter it. Jesus could not be any stronger in the Greek language. When he says never, he means never, ever, a double negative, by no means enter. Now, this is important. What qualifies a child or a childlike person to enter and own God's kingdom? And if we don't get this answer right, brothers and sisters, friends, we're in big trouble. So please, just for the next little bit, pay, pay attention. To understand what Jesus means here, we need to avoid two extremes in how we view kids. In ancient and modern times, cruel, hard hearted men mostly, have thought children were only had the value of what they could do for adult males. And the result of this very bad attitude toward children has resulted in all kinds of terrible abuses. But we can swing to the opposite error, and that is uh, something that has occurred only in the modern world. And that is a sentimental, idealized view of kids that they are innocent, they are humble, They're spontaneous. They're more in touch with nature, more in touch with themselves than adults. Well, this very misguided idea can result in sometimes parents or grandparents overindulging 
their children or grandchildren, refusing to discipline them, or even placing that child in danger by making the whole world revolve around them. In my opinion, one of the absolute worst things that has been done in the public sector is this whole self-esteem thing. Uh, I think there's a whole generation of kids that have been really damaged by that. We all need to have a healthy, realistic view of who we are, our strengths and weaknesses. And if we don't face up to both, we are not prepared to function in this world, which has no mercy, as you know, on our weaknesses and rarely gives us much credit for our strengths. So we need to be able to function independently instead of depending on what other people think of us. We need to have a correct image of ourselves before God and with others. So that's a, a heritage we can pass on to our kids. But what does the Bible say about children? Children are sinners. Let's look at two verses here. Romans 3.23, you can all uh, have memorized it, many of you. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Ephesians 2.3, we too, Paul writes, all previously, when we weren't Christians, lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also, including children. You don't have to work with children very, often, very long, whether it's your own or someone else's, to know that they're sinners. Uh, we're all born rebels. The first, one of the first words every child learns to say is no. Um, you don't have to learn another language to, to know when a child is whining. If you go to Taipei or to Beijing, in Chinese, you can know when a little boy is whining against his parents. You don't have to know a word of Chinese to understand a whine. So what is it about children that we adults should imitate in order to get and get into God's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, it is not what kids do, it is what they are that is what the characteristic Jesus is referring to. Little kids are helpless. Children are totally dependent on others. A child has absolutely nothing to give. Whatever a child gets, he or she must receive by sheer grace on the basis of neediness rather than any kind of merit in him or herself. What does every child do naturally? They reach up their little hand for someone to lead them, for someone to help them. That is a picture of faith. That's what our faith must be like to enter God's kingdom. Not holding on to our good works to earn our way to heaven, but letting go. Only trusting Jesus and his perfect sacrifice on the cross to pay for our sins. God will not take us unless our hands are empty. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. The great hymn, Rock of Ages. We must come to Christ like a child with no claims, no credits, and no clout. Have you ever in your life come empty-handed to God, telling him, Lord, I can't save myself. I'm sinful, helpless, hopeless, bound for hell without you. But I depend on you, Lord Jesus, plus nothing else to save and to forgive me forever. If you can say that sincerely to God from your heart, he will let you in and let you inherit his kingdom forever. But if you're holding on to anything else, like the good things you do, to make you right with God, God is going to say to you, you know that other thing that's so important to you? It's more important than I am. Goodbye. That day that the parents brought their little children to Jesus, some of them were only babies. They brought them for Jesus just to touch them. But Jesus did much more. Do you remember in the Old Testament again and again what we saw? The patriarchs, the great men of God, they blessed their sons before they died. Now, you have to understand what that blessing was. They were just conveying or conferring God's blessing. They were like the pipeline that carries the oil. They weren't the oil. God is the real one who blesses. So when Jesus blessed these kids, he was doing not what the patriarchs did. He was doing what only God can do because God is the true blesser. So who is Jesus? 
He's got to be God from whom all blessings flow. I kind of put a couple of illustrations up here. I'm very careful what I pick. Most of the um, paintings or illustrations of this scene are very cutesy and very sentimental, but I love the one on the upper left. Jesus is looking daggers at the disciples. And of course, that's exactly what was going on. I mean, he was furious with these guys. And so, so I put that with this one. Here's Jesus laughing and yucking it up with the kids. And if you're around children much, you know that they make us laugh. They are so funny. And I'm sure Jesus was delighted as these little kids would bring him a flower or tell him some funny story or something. And so that's the heart of God toward children in both of those. On the one hand, furious with anybody who would stand in the way of a child coming to Christ. But on the other hand, just enjoying them. That's God as shown to us in Jesus Christ. So in this little paragraph... Jesus clearly teaches us that kids can be saved. They too can become growing disciples now and, of course, as they grow up physically. The question is, as a church, how can we help children along in their spiritual journey? How can we evangelize and disciple children? I'd like to make a very few suggestions in the remaining time that we have together. The primary place for the spiritual formation of children is where? The home. The primary agents to evangelize and disciple children are their parents. And the one who should take the lead in this is the father. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The Deuteronomy 6, 4 is the John 3, 16 of Israel the most important verse in Israel. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's spoken to adults. These words that I am giving you today, wrote Moses on the day he died, are to be in your heart. We cannot pass along a love for God, brothers and sisters, to our children or grandchildren unless that love is in us to start with. It must be here first. But then he says, repeat them to your children. We have to tell them over and over. We don't learn by just hearing it once. We have to hear it again and again. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Do we do this as parents, as grandparents? <laughs> Repeating the word of God, his truths, what he's like to our children and grandchildren, even to our neighbor kids, over and over? Do we talk about him when we sit in the house over a meal? When we're, instead of walking, when we're driving around in the car? Before bed and in the morning? You see, what, it's one of the most practical paragraphs in the whole Bible about how to evangelize and disciple kids. It needs to happen in the home. And even wearing jewelry or T-shirts, I think this is a blanket invitation to wear these cool uh, shirts that have Scripture on them and all these great phrases that we see. Also, to hang Scripture in your home. I know a family back in Texas, and they stenciled the Word of God on their wallpaper in the main room of their house where their guests are. So it's permanently there for them to talk about. Uh, so many ways to apply that. So many ways. But then the New Testament, isn't it interesting? Deuteronomy 6.4, Ephesians 6.4. Easy to remember it. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, mothers are included in this command. But the primary responsibility for the spiritual development of children rests on the father's shoulders. And yet, what happens in the majority of Christian households? It is mom who does most of the talking about spiritual things with the children. That's wrong, biblically. And that's one reason, I think, why so many kids are out of whack spiritually. You say, well, Frank, what about homes where dad is not a Christian yet or where both parents are unsaved? Okay, if dad is not a believer, then a Christian mother, and I would think grandmother, must take up the slack. But there also needs to be somewhere in that mix a spiritual father to help disciple the kids. 
Let's look at a New Testament example. 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul writes, clearly recalling, he's writing to Timothy, clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois, then in your mother Eunice, and that I am convinced it's in you also. Do you remember who Timothy's grandfather was? Lois' husband? Come on, somebody. Who was Lois' husband? Clark. Clark Kent. Is anybody paying attention? I want to be sure you're listening to me, okay? This is very important. Then 2 Timothy 2.1. You therefore, my son, Paul writes, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses Commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I want you to look at, this is one of the most important verses in the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. it's easy to remember, mnemonic device. 2.2.2. 2, 2. And what you have heard, Timothy, from me, Paul's the spiritual father, Timothy is the spiritual son, in the presence of many witnesses who were also like brothers, uncles, fathers to Timothy, commit to faithful men, Paul's spiritual grandsons, who will then be able to teach others spiritual great-grandsons. There are four generations in that verse, spiritually. And I am honored that God would have mercy on me, that in my life so far, I have spiritual sons, I have spiritual grandsons, and if God gives me the life and the health to continue, I pray that before I die or before the Lord Jesus comes back, I will be able to see spiritual great-grandsons. It doesn't just have to be physical. It can be spiritual. And we see that in that amazing verse. In Timothy's case, his dad was a pagan. So his mom and his grandma taught him, but they were helped along by his spiritual dad, Paul. And in the local church, we have ministries like Sunday school, like Vacation Bible school like summer camps, two and four children and youth like Timothy who don't have everybody at home who can teach and to mentor them. And that is why I am very convinced that one of our main ministries in our church for men needs to be being spiritual dads, spiritual uncles, spiritual brothers uh, to especially kids who don't have one or both parents at home who can teach and mentor them and disciple them. But what has happened over the years? Dads and moms have disobeyed these clear commands in God's Word. Many parents have delegated the spiritual formation of their kids to the church. But do you really think that one or two hours a week is enough for a child to grow spiritually into the kind of person they need to be? I don't think so. We need the church and the home to be a team where the primary ministry of the church becomes the discipling of the parents so that then in the home, the parents can disciple the children. And the whole thing is a dynamic cycle weekly so that as we come in and out these doors, the parents are better prepared to work with the kids at home. And so that Sunday school is just an adjunct. It is, the children's church is just an add-on, not the whole thing. Two quick comments. Sunday school was invented in the 19th century by a man named Robert Rakes, specifically for unchurched kids. Sunday school was never designed for Christian children. It was designed to win and disciple kids whose parents were totally pagan. But what has happened? The evangelical church and all churches who still have Sunday school um, have basically turned Sunday school into a spiritual babysitting service. And sadly, the dis main discipler of kids, and that not, should not be. Uh, Miss Margaret has a curriculum that she has introduced in the children's church here, which is trying to take some initial steps in this team concept. And so any of you parents or grandparents who have children in children's church, I would sincerely encourage you to take home the little handouts or the little projects that Miss Margaret and the other very faithful workers back there give out because that is part of this concept to apply at home what is taught here. And I think that's a very, very biblical way to equip the family, the parents, to help and learn, teach the children at home. One result of children who've grown up in church, 
with their primary spiritual input coming from like Sunday school is that when they are adults, they turn away from the Lord. Children from Christian homes must one day decide for themselves to make their parents' God their God. In the Old Testament, Joshua chose to make the God of his fathers his God. Let's look at the very famous verse, Joshua 24, 15. Joshua said toward the end of his life when he was an old man, but if it doesn't please you to worship Yahweh, the Lord of Israel, choose for yourselves today the one you will worship. And he lays it out. The gods your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now inheriting, living. As for me and my family, we will worship Yahweh. We will worship the Lord. It's very interesting. This verse tells us that that the gods that their fathers worshiped beyond the Euphrates, when Abraham and Sarah lived in the Ur of the Chaldees, it was the center, it was New York in the ancient Near East. They had running waters in their houses. They did business and bank translations, uh, transit, trans, um, Actions, there we go, transactions on clay tablets. When other people in other countries were living in caves or in tents, this was the center of civilization, and yet it was totally pagan, worshiping idols, worshiping all the stars and the planets, astrology. Yet within four generations, Abraham's family, because they were failing to pass on to their children, were turning into the same kind of people that Abraham came out of in Ur. And so, just like we saw the four spiritual generations in the New Testament, the four uh, generations from Abraham to Jacob's sons were beginning to become pagan. If it, wasn't, if it were not for Joseph, um, that family would have gone down the tubes spiritually. This is the biggest single decision every child who grows up in church must make. Will they follow the God of their parents or not? And tragically, an increasing number of young adults in the 18 to 25 demographic are not choosing the Lord. Now, when this happens, many godly parents who sincerely kept not only their children in church, but did teach them God's word at home, they feel guilty and they beat themselves up asking what went wrong? What did we do wrong? Well, here's my answer. In many cases, sure, the parents could have done more. But in many other families, there's nothing more that the parents could have done. No parent is perfect. All parents make mistakes. But if we're going to put a guilt trip on all the parents who have a rebellious adult child, then we'd better blame God. Because God is the perfect family. I mean, God is the perfect father. But what does he have? He has us Christians who, like the disciples in the book of Mark, keep sinning, keep rebelling, keep failing. Does that reflect badly on God? Of course not. We Christians sin because we choose to sin, and an adult child who has been raised the right way, if they so choose, they can rebel against the very teachings that their parents tirelessly tried to invest in them. I wish it were not like that. But that's the way it is. But I do think that we can do better going forward. I don't think we have to lose as many young people as we have. But how do we do that? How can we keep from losing so many of our young adults after they have grown up in church? I don't have all the answers. This is a very complicated thing. But I would like to end with one solution, one suggestion. And I get that from the Old Testament. It is for us to imitate a man named Asaph. Let's move forward to Psalm 78. A masculine that was a type of music of Asaph. He writes, my people, hear my instruction. Listen to what I say. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past. Things could also be translated words, we have heard and known and that our fathers have passed down to us. We must not hide them from their children, but must tell a future generation the praises of the Lord, his might and the wonderful works he has performed. He established a testimony in Jacob and set up a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know. They were to rise and tell their children so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. If you look closely at this paragraph, we don't have time to examine it. There are several generations envisioned here. Asaph was a worship leader in the time of David 
In this Psalm 78, Asaph shared a grand vision of passing his faith on to his descendants generation after generation. And what I love about this guy, as we say today, he didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. Asaph not only taught his sons, but he involved his sons with him in worshiping the Lord. Let's look at 1 Chronicles 25, verse 1. David and the officers of the army also set apart some of the sons of Asaph, skipping ahead, who were to prophesy, accompanied by lyres, harps, and cymbals. This is the list of the men who performed their service, or we'd say ministry. From Asaph's sons, four of the sons, whether that was all of them or only part of them, Zakur, Joseph, Nethaniah, and Asarela, sons of Asaph, under Asaph's authority, who prophesied under the authority of the king. Asaph passed his faith on to his sons as they led worship with him. Then his sons and subsequent generations did the very same thing. Let's skip ahead 500 years. When the Israelites returned from exile, look at how many of Asaph's descendants came back. Let's move forward. In Ezra chapter 2, verse 41, the singers included those come back from the exile, Asaph's descendants, 128. That's men. These 128 great, 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 great grandsons of Asaph, they didn't just come back to the land. They also were still leading God's people in worship. Look at Ezra 3, verse 10. When the builders had laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests dressed in their robes and holding trumpets, and the Levites descended from Asaph, holding what? Symbols, same instruments that their ancestors used, took their positions to praise the Lord as King David of Israel had instructed. They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, for He is good, His faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house or the temple had been laid. One reason why Asaph's sons and succeeding generations of their sons stuck with the Lord was because each generation of fathers and sons were involved together in ministry in the temple. As a result, Asaph's descendants over hundreds of years lived to see the grand vision of their ancestor in Psalm 78 fulfilled in their own lives. That is amazing, but that is possible. My vision and dream for us at Lafayette Bible Chapel is that we copy Asaph's example. There is method in my madness up front here at the slides each week. I pray that some of those little kids back there in children's church, as they grow up, will take the place of Patrick and Bailey and Matt, and that then they will move on to other ministries in our church. I want us to have real ministries here and in our community, at camp, and on mission trips that our children can participate in. And when they are involved in ministry themselves, they're not just watching somebody else do it. But they're seeing firsthand how God can use them and work through them in ministry. But there's a catch, adults. It's not enough for our young people and our children to be involved in ministry. They need to see us doing it. Because if we don't, what's going to happen? They're going to grow up with the conclusion that, well, if mom and dad, if my grandparents weren't involved, then I don't have to be either. That's the wrong conclusion. Dads, are you involved in ministry with your sons? Not just doing home projects, but are you doing anything in ministry with your sons? Fathers, do you take time with your sons and daughters to read and learn God's word at home? and not just leave it to mom to do it. Men, do we serve together, our children, spiritual and otherwise, in any kind of Christian ministry? Granddads, if you take time to play with your grandkids, why not take time to do ministry with those grandchildren? Christian families, how about getting involved in ministry here at church together as a family? One of our families a while back heard a similar challenge that I gave, and very soon after that, they joined the team that cleans our church. Very humble, but they're doing that together as a family. And I'd like to just challenge you that 
If you have a desire to do something together as a family, to do that, talk to one of the elders. Talk to me. It may be something as humble as cleaning the church, but it may be something that our church could start. The key is, is your family involved in anything together in ministry? I think it's one of the greatest ways to see that kids are glued closer to the church and to the things of the Lord so that when the time comes, they will choose to stick with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this very simple passage, and I ask today that you would um, apply your word where it is uh, appropriate in the lives of dads, granddads, families. Lord, that's up to you and your spirit. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.